During his lifetime, Jack London was the most popular, most highly paid, and most controversial author in the world. Today, he is mostly remembered for his stories, Call of the Wild and White Fang. But he was a giant in the development of realistic fiction, as well as a social reformer, photojournalist, environmentalist, and adventurer. He wrote hundreds of short stories, 50 books, 15 plays, numerous news articles, and social essays, which had a lasting impact on literature and society. London was one of the first, really, to strike out in a new vein of writing. He was, he was a romantic figure for people. Um, they found that, that he was not only good-looking and charismatic, but his life of adventure was, was very appealing to people, very attractive. An awful lot of people wished they could live that life. And since they couldn't, they lived it vicariously through reading about him and then reading his works. Even before his birth, Jack was making headlines. In June of 1875, Flora Wellman, Jack's future mother, was the subject of the article, A Discarded Wife, which appeared in the San Francisco Chronicle. Day before yesterday, Mrs. Cheney, wife of Professor W.H. Cheney, the astrologer, attempted suicide by taking laudanum. Failing in the effort, she yesterday shot herself with a pistol in the forehead. The bowl glanced off, inflicting only a flesh wound, and friends interfered before she could accomplish her suicidal purpose. The suicide attempts took place after Flora Wellman, known as Mrs. Cheney, was abandoned by her lover, Professor Cheney, when she refused to destroy her unborn child. Seven months later, the Chronicle reported the birth of John Cheney, who was later to be known as Jack London. On the night that Jack London was born, his mother, Flora Wellman, became quite weakened by the birth and pregnancy and birth. And so, unfortunately, she was not able to nurse her baby. Uh, that same night, another woman, Mrs. Virginia Prentiss, gave birth to a child, but the child died shortly after birth. The doctor in the hospital recommended that Flora allow her baby to be wet nursed by Mrs. Prentiss, a former slave from Tennessee who had made her way out to Oakland and was part of a quite vibrant African-American community there. She not only took uh, young Jack uh, to be wet nurse, but he lived with her until he was weaned at the age of three. On September 7, 1876, Flora married John London, a Civil War veteran and carpenter with two young daughters, Eliza and Ida. Jack didn't know John London wasn't his real father until the age of 20 when he contacted W.H. Cheney. Professor Cheney denied being his father, claiming he was impotent at the time, and informed Jack that although he had lived with Flora, he was never married to her. On November 30th, 1898, in a letter to Mabel Applegarth, Jack writes, When I was seven years old, I once opened a girl's basket and stole a piece of meat a little paste the size of my two fingers. I ate it, but I never repeated it. In those days like Esau, I would have literally sold my birthright for a mess of pottage, a piece of meat. Great God. When those youngsters threw chunks of meat on the ground, I could have dragged it from the dirt and eaten it, but I did not. Just imagine the development of my mind and my soul under such material conditions. From the time I stole the meat and knew no coal above my belly, to now when the coal is higher, it has been hunger, nothing but hunger. Mrs. Prentice was an extremely important figure in his life, particularly because his own mother at times could be quite cold to him and was very preoccupied with making a living. Mrs. Prentice was very warm, maternal. He lived with that family off and on, uh, you know, for many years until he was 15. It's said by the scholars who have researched Mrs. Prentice that she taught him to read using the King James Bible. And furthermore, that she's the one who called him Jack because he was her little jumping Jack in her lap. Uh, his own family called him Johnny at home. 
when the London family was too poor to provide him with a lunch, he'd go to Aunt Jenny's house and have a good meal. The lovely sequel of that is that Daddy provided for Aunt Jenny until the day she died, long after she was able to do any work. In 1885, the family is broke and moves back to Oakland. Jack enters the Garfield School. By this time, he has already become a voracious reader. He discovers the Oakland Public Library. There he meets the librarian, Ina Coolbreath, who takes him under her wing and helps guide his reading. Miss Coolbreath is named California's first poet laureate in 1915. Jack reads morning, noon, and night. But things go from bad to worse for the Londons. They move again and again. Soon they are living in the poorest part of town. By the age of 10, Jack must take whatever jobs he can to help make ends meet. He delivers newspapers, sets up pins in a bowling alley, sweeps out saloons, works on an ice wagon, and does countless other odd jobs. All his paydays go to Flora. On the street and in the schoolyards, Jack learns to fight. Sometimes, he fights to protect his right to read in the schoolyard. Other times, he fights to protect the money he earns. Jack graduates from the eighth grade and leaves the school to help support his family. He lands a job at Hickmott's Cannery, where he works 12 hours a day and often as much as 16 or 18 hours a day for 10 cents an hour. He has become a work beast. In 1892, Jack's stepfather is injured in a train accident, and Jack must step up to the plate to provide for his family. He borrows $300 from Jenny Prentice, buys a boat named the Razzle Dazzle, and becomes an oyster pirate. A 17-year-old waif named Mamie, queen of the oyster pirates, joins him aboard ship, and so begins his first love affair. What are you doing here? Fell asleep below. He soon becomes known as the Prince of the Oyster Pirates. The pirates raid the oyster beds owned by the railroads and sell the stolen wares on the Oakland docks. Jack develops a drinking problem. He makes enemies among the other pirates and the mast of his ship is burned. Soon there are so many pirates raiding the oyster beds it is hard to make a living. So Jack switches sides joins the fish patrol, and helps enforce the laws in the Bay Area. After one particularly exhausting adventure with the fish patrol, Jack's drinking problem gets the better of him. And after nearly killing himself through alcohol, Jack signs up for a sealing expedition off the coast of Japan. Aboard the Sophie Sutherland, it takes a knockdown, drag out fight with a Swedish sailor named Big Red before the crew finally accepts him. One of his life's proudest moments comes when during the trip he takes the wheel of the ship and guides her through a typhoon. Upon his return home at age 17, Jack enters a writing contest sponsored by the Morning Call and wins first prize for his story, A Typhoon Off the Coast of Japan. Although he is dropped out of school after the eighth grade, he is determined to become a writer. The financial panic of 1893 caused a major depression. In 1894, Jack joins Coxey's Army of the Unemployed for the first march on Washington to protest unemployment in America. After leaving the march, he hops freight trains and rides the rails across the country. In hobo camps, he listens to the tales of men who have lost their jobs and their strength. Jack learns the lingo of the hobos, as well as how to tell a good story to get something to eat. These tales can be found in his book, The Road. In Niagara Falls, Jack is arrested for vagrancy and thrown in prison for a month without a trial. This is what he claims turns him to socialism. In later years, his books and social writings will be translated throughout the world. For the left wing in France, he was a sort of reference. Since uh, the end of World War, the, the First World War, and uh, in all the newspapers of the left uh, Fra French wing in, in politics, 
you can find uh, articles about Jack London and you can find the, uh, the novels and the short stories of Jack London. But Jack London was also uh, famous in the right wing of the, of the French politics uh, because of the heroes of Jack London and because of the strength, because of the uh, adventure and uh, these heroes are, are self-made men. And so it's uh, very interesting to read Jack London especially when fascism was rising up uh, during the 30s in Europe and uh, both the left wing and the right wing used Jack London. In 1895, Jack re-enters high school and quickly drops out. He crams on his own for six months, takes the University of Berkeley entrance exams and passes. Jack falls in love with a college student three years his senior, a Mabel Applegarth. He also meets Bess Mattern, who helps tutor him and teaches him to take photographs. Jack's photos will eventually appear in books, newspapers, and magazines, and Jack himself will become one of the most photographed men in America. People don't tend to realize that Jack London was a photographer at all, let alone that he took uh, as many as uh, 12,000 or more photographs and that he was a very talented photographer, not at all a casual shutterbug, as most of us are. 1897. Due to financial difficulties, Jack drops out of the university after one semester. Gold rush fever is sweeping the country. Jack's brother-in-law, Captain Shepard, stakes Jack to accompany him to the Yukon to search for gold. July 1897. They set sail from San Francisco on the Umatilla for the Klondike. Once we got to Juneau, the race was on to get to Dawson before winter set in. I was in a hurry. Everyone was in a hurry. Each day, those that couldn't afford to hire Indians had to carry 1,000 pounds of goods eight miles up the Daya Trail to the top of Chilicoot Pass. Captain Shepard only lasted two days and had to turn back. Many a man fell by the way. Thousands were out and disheartened, turned back from the passes. I partnered up with Fred Thompson, Merritt Sloper, and Jim Goodman. And at Lake Linderman, we built a makeshift boat, the Yukon Bell. I was the only sailor amongst the men and was elected Captain Jack. We crossed the lake and had to shoot through Box Canyon and White Horse Rapids. Of the two, the White Horse was the more dangerous. But we could either shoot it in two minutes or take two days portaging everything around. We watched as another boat tried it and went down losing all its goods and four of its crew in the whirlpool. The men left it up to me to decide if we could make it. Hell, I said, I wouldn't sell my chance to go through. We had to fight our way across Lake LaBarge in the midst of a blizzard, the lake freezing up behind us. We managed to get to the Stewart River just before the freeze up and found an abandoned cabin and set up housekeeping. Jack and his partners settle into the cabin and trek to Henderson Creek where they stake their claims. First day out, they find some color. They believe their claims are worth at least a quarter of a million in gold. The old timers have a good laugh when they rush into camp with the news. Fool's gold, mica, was what they had found. Still, they headed into Dawson to stake their claims. More than 30,000 Stampeders had poured into Dawson since the strike at Bonanza Creek in 1896. There were prospectors, bankers, gamblers, newspaper men, butchers, saloon keepers, prostitutes, con men, and storekeepers. There were 22 saloons, six sawmills, stores, and camp tents everywhere. Prices were sky high. A meal that cost 15 cents in San Francisco cost $5 in Dawson. Here, the filthy poor rubbed elbows and stood shoulder to shoulder with the filthy rich. Men gambled on the damnedest things. Dog fights, dog sled races, two drops of water running down a window pane. And everyone had a story. In Dawson, I met James and Louis Bond. They owned a dog named Jack that would change my life. Five years later, I changed his name to Buck. 
and he became the main character in Call of the Wild. Our cabin back on Henderson Creek became a hub for people to drop by and sit around the fire and tell tales. There wasn't much else to do when the weather outside was 40 below. Inside, it was like living in a refrigerator. There were no fruits or vegetables, and I got scurvy. I could barely walk. By the spring, I was so weak, practically crippled from the waist down. I lost my front teeth. My food gave out. Dr. Harvey took me in. We built a raft together, tore down his cabin, and sold the logs in Dawson. After that, I was in and out of the hospital, hustling money where and how I could. When the ice broke and the river opened, I left my claim in the hands of my partners and headed for the outside. John Torson, Charles Taylor, and I put together a makeshift boat and set sail on a 2,000-mile journey down the Yukon to St. Michael. When we reached Anvik, I got hold of some raw potatoes and tomatoes from a priest. They were worth more to me than an El Dorado claim. I reached St. Michael in better shape than when I left Dawson and got a job as a coal stoker aboard the SS Bartlett to pay my passage home. In July of 1898, I returned home to find my father had died and my mother was caring for my five-year-old nephew, Johnny Miller. I was broke. I needed to find work, but I could only find odd jobs. Soon it would be winter and men would be pouring into the city from the countryside. I tried to sell my stories, but to no avail. I pawned everything I had. By Christmas, I was desperate and I determined to kill myself. I wrote letters to my most intimate friends, but then by a twist of fate, an old friend of mine who was also determined to kill herself visited me. And in talking her out of her suicide, I convinced myself not to take my own life. A few weeks later, the Black Cat magazine bought my short story, A Thousand Deaths. I was saved by the Black Cat short story. It brought in $40. Jack joins the Ruskin Club, whose membership includes the Bay Area's foremost liberals and intellectuals. He begins writing social essays and lectures at the Socialist Local. Jack meets and becomes enamored of a brilliant young Jewish Stanford University student named Anna Strunsky, who is known as the Girl Socialist of San Francisco. Anna constantly challenges Jack's ethnic prejudices, views on love, and his capitalist version of socialism. Jack falls in love with Anna. They collaborate on a book about the philosophy of sex and love, the Kempton Waste Letters. In 1900, Jack's Alaska stories are selling. Nanetta Eames interviews Jack for the Overland Monthly and introduces him to her niece, Charmian Kittredge. They make a date to meet in the future, but it is canceled when Jack gets married. Although still in love with Anna Stransky, Jack proposes to Bess Mattern. In a letter to Nanetta Eames, Jack writes, Sunday last, I had not the slightest intention of doing what I am going to do. I am to marry Bessie Mattern this coming Saturday. Rash boy, I hear you say, but by this I shall be steadied and be able to devote more time to my work. Although not in love with Bess or she with him, he and Bess marry on April 7, 1900. For their honeymoon, Jack and Bess take a three-day bicycle trip in the country. This is also the day of the publication of his first book, The Son of the Wolf, a collection of short stories. The book does very well, and Jack is hailed as the Kipling of the North. I think London's position, you know, as a writer, uh, as an American writer, from an international perspective, I think in many ways he epitomizes America. He's someone who was self-educated, uh, largely self-made. Uh, he was also a frontier writer. He kind of embodies this kind of folk image uh, that I think people around the world associate with a kind of American idealism. On January 15th, 1901, Jack and Bess's first daughter, Joan, is born. Also in January, Jack agrees to run for mayor of Oakland on the socialist ticket. Things are not going well between Bessie and Jack. Their natures are too different. Bessie despises company, is very prudish, and lacking in humor. 
Jack is gregarious, fun-loving, and romantic by nature. Jack's friends, a circle of poets, writers, sculptors, actors, and artists known as the crowd, are a constant grade on Bess's nerves and the family pocketbook. Jack hosts his friends on Wednesday get-togethers at his home, where practical jokes abound and the liquor flows freely. Bess is very jealous of Anna Strunsky, with whom she believes Jack is in love. No matter how much money Jack makes, he is always in debt. Supporting his mother's household, as well as his own and several friends, he writes a thousand words a day, every day, to make ends meet. He will keep up this work stint for the rest of his life. Jack's first novel, A Daughter of the Snows, is not very successful, and his publisher, McLure's, ends his monthly stipend of $125. To cover expenses, Jack writes articles for the San Francisco Examiner and obtains an advance from George Brett at Macmillan for his book of short stories, Children of the Frost. In the fall of 1901, Jack receives 245 votes for mayor. In 1902, Bess is pregnant again. Jack travels to England and writes The People of the Abyss, an expose of homelessness in London. As he often did with his journalism, he, he used um, overseas assignments to escape woman troubles. Uh, he, he had a series of, of, of uh, troubles with women, um, and, and he was very adept at escaping them, I have to say. Um, it got him out of a good deal of, of, of discomfort at home. Uh, in 1902, he was, he was still married to his first wife, Bess, and they were not in any way happy. They were completely ill-suited. Um, I believe that it's quite possible that she loved him very genuinely and very deeply. He did not love her, and he made no bones about it, and that must have been deeply hurtful to her. Uh, he was drawn to Anna Strunsky, later Anna Strunsky Walling. So the long and the short of it is, I'm hired to cover the Boer War, but by the time I reach New York, the war's over, and the generals have set sail for England. So. I decide to go to London to interview the generals for the American Press Association and cover the coronation of Edward VII while I'm there. And I get my new publisher, George Bernard Macmillan, to back me to write a book on the London slums. My first stop is a used clothes shop in the East End. I bargain with the owner for the sort of worn outfit a sailor might wear. Next, I must find somewhere to stay. The consulate tells me I am crazy, taking my life into my hands taking lodgings in the slums of the East End. I find a small room in a single-family house where I can write in privacy. Single-family homes are practically extinct in this part of London. Why? Because the landlords can get five and six families into a house like the one I'm staying in, so they can pay more rent for the house than a single family can afford. In the reconfigured houses, families occupy single rooms with no bathtubs or ventilation six, eight, ten to a room. I pay six shillings for the week and walk down to the East India docks where I strike up a conversation with a young out-of-work sailor who takes me for the same and says to me, my mate cut up rough last night and was pinched by the bobbies. I might have a room for the right sort. We have a few drinks on me and he offers me a place to sleep. It is small and snug, almost like being aboard ship. At least you won't be on the street carrying the banner for the night. Carrying the banner? Those that walk the streets the night through can't get into the workhouses. The bobbies don't let them rest on the streets. Keep them walking all night long. Carrying the banner? Aye, you don't want to be caught out with that lot. Up all night and dead tired by morning. Looking for work and too tired to work if you find any. August 9th, 1902 the coronation day of Edward VII. The streets are filled with people linked arm in arm singing the honeysuckle and the bee. And the celebrations at the pubs go on into the night. I make my way to the parks where the benches are filled with the destitute trying to grab some sleep. I approach an old man dressed in the clothes of an East Ender on a bench. How did you like the procession, mate? How did I like it? A bloody good chance I says to myself or asleep with all the coppers away. So I turned into the corner there, along with 50 others. But I couldn't sleep a lie in there, hungry and thinking how I worked all my years of my life. 
and now I had no place to rest me head. And the music coming to me and the cheers and cannon till I got to being almost an anarchist and wanted to blow out the brains of the Lord Chamberlain. Why the Lord Chamberlain? Not the king who's getting crowned. Can't precisely say, but that's the way I feel about it. Why they spend a third of the country's wealth on the damned officers and servants and such. 500 lords and ladies owning a fifth of England. The toilers of the country like myself go without. I see your point. No offense, lad, but let me get some sleep, will ya? The old man turns away from me, so I make my way down to the river. It is the same by the Thames at 3 a.m. Each bench is jammed with sleeping occupants, for as many women as men, and the great majority of them, male and female, are old. On one bench is a family, a man sitting upright with a sleeping babe in his arms, his wife asleep, her head on his shoulder, and in her lap, the head of a sleeping youngster. The man's eyes are wide open. He is staring out over the water and thinking. I can only imagine the grimness of his thoughts. The next day, I joined a line of homeless men waiting outside the casual ward in Whitechapel trying to get a bed, but there are no beds to be had. We walked several miles to another homeless shelter, but that is filled up as well. I have been out again tonight watching as the homeless are moved all night long from street to street by the police. I walk the rain-swept streets with them looking for shelter, huddled in corners when we can find a place out of the wind. I've read of misery and seen a bit, but this beats anything I could ever have imagined. I think I should die if I had to live two years in the East End of London. Today I have composed, typed, and revised 4,000 words and over. I have just finished. It is one in the morning. I am worn out and exhausted, and my nerves are blunted with what I have seen and the suffering it has cost me. I am made sick by this human hellhole called the East End. I have heard of God's country, but this is the country God has forgotten that he forgot. The book stirs up controversy and helps bring about social change in England. On October 20th, 1902, Jack's second daughter, Bess, is born. Jack returns home from Europe after the birth and tries to patch things up with Bessie. His pet name for Bess is Mommy Girl, and he is Daddy Boy. But there is little magic in their marriage. In December, Jack begins work on The Call of the Wild. I sold all my rights to The Call of the Wild for $2,000. My publisher, George Bredett Macmillan, painted the title until it became a number one bestseller. I never made another penny from it in royalties, but I've got no kick. They took a big gamble promoting it, and it made my career. In 1903, The Call of the Wild is published and catapults Jack to international fame. Translated into 70 languages, The Call of the Wild has never been out of print. Many leading stars played in Jack London films. Clark Gable and Loretta Young starred in the first talking motion picture version of Call of the Wild in 1935. Oh, I wish you hadn't. <laughs> Jack falls in love with Charmian Kittredge and separates from Bess Mattern. Charmian is everything that Bess is not. She is sexy, adventurous, unconventional, highly intelligent, and available. Jack feels he has finally found a true comrade and mate woman. Soon after the publication of Call of the Wild, Jack London finished The Sea Wolf. The Sea Wolf would become phenomenally popular on both sides of the Atlantic. One of Jack London's most successful books, it has been made into a dozen feature films. Edward G. Robinson gives the performance of a lifetime in the 1941 classic, The Sea Wolf. This is the fifth feature film made from the novel. My strength justifies me, Mr. Van Wyden. The fact that I can kill you and let you live as I choose. The fact that I control the destinies of all on board the ship. The fact that it's my will and my will alone that rules here. Ambrose Bierce, one of Jack London's harshest critics, cannot help but applaud The Sea Wolf. The great thing, and is among the greatest of things, is that tremendous creation, Wolf Larsen. The hewing out and setting up of such a figure 
is enough for a man to do in one lifetime. Jack leaves the editing of The Sea Wolf in the hands of his friends, the poet George Sterling and Charmian Kittredge. Jack sets sail on January 7, 1904 for Yokohama, aboard the SS Siberia. In 1904, he traveled to Korea uh, for the Hearst Corporation uh, as a photojournalist as well as a war correspondent to cover the Russo-Japanese War. And there exist now 13 photograph albums with his photographs of scenes captured in cities, in towns, on the battlefields, uh, in covering every aspect of the war. And he sent back uh, articles that he wrote about what he saw and what he experienced over there during the Russo-Japanese War. And his journalism appeared on the front pages of the main sections of newspapers. He was very, very well known as a journalist. And I've, I've noticed that in those newspaper representations of his stories, there almost never is a photograph that he took in the field or in the battles, but instead there's a portrait of Jack London accompanying his article. And I think two reasons for that. He was so well known that it was interesting to people that Jack London was covering the Russo-Japanese War. They were almost more interested in that than they were in the, the story of the war itself. The second reason, of course, is that at that time there was no easy and convenient way to send images back to the United States to be published. He could, he could write his articles and send them back by cable and by wire, but uh, photographs, not, not so easy. And so his photographs, many of them have never been published until quite recently. So um, it, it's an interesting story of how correspondents functioned as well as the stories that they were capturing in the battle zones. Jack covers the Japanese-Russian War for the Hearst Papers and warns of the ascendancy of Japan and eventually China. He also predicts Japan will eventually attack Hawaii. In advance of all the other reporters, without permission of the Japanese government, he risks life and limb to send back photos and articles of the conflict. After striking a Japanese soldier who Jack believes is stealing his food, Jack is again arrested and faces a possible court-martial and sentence of death. It takes the intervention of Theodore Roosevelt to get Jack released from prison in Korea. Upon his return to America on the SS Siberia, Jack is served with divorce papers from Bess, who names Anna Strunsky as the cause for the separation. But it's Charmian Kittredge, with whom Jack is now in love. Jack's book, The Sea Wolf, has been published and is becoming a number one bestseller. But Bess has attached Jack's bank account Jack settles with Bess and promises to provide for her and the children if she drops Anna Strunsky's name from the proceedings. Bess reluctantly acquiesces. The things I had fought for and burned my midnight oil for had failed me. Success, I despised it. Recognition was dead ashes. Love of woman, it was like all the rest. I wanted alcohol. I required two, three, four drinks to get an effect commensurate with the effect an average man got out of one drink. One rule I observed, I never took a drink until my day's work of writing a thousand words was done. Waiting for his divorce, Jack is secretly engaged to Charmian, who works from Wake Robin Lodge in Glen Ellen, typing and correcting his manuscripts. To avoid scandal, she can only infrequently make clandestine visits to Jack's apartment at 1216 Telegraph Hill in Oakland to see her lover. This separation causes Charmian great anxiety, especially when she becomes aware that Jack has begun an affair with the poet and critic Blanche Partington. The crowd, including Jack's best friend George Sterling and his wife Carrie, encourage the relationship with Blanche, and try to woo Jack away from Charmian. But when Charmian offers Jack his freedom, Jack refuses to renounce Charmian, breaks off with Blanche, and takes Charmian's part against the crowd's backstabbing gossip. I was suffering from mental and physical exhaustion. I thought I might have syphilis or be dying from a malignant tumor. I meditated suicide coolly. My regret was there were too many dependent on me for food and shelter for me to quit living, but that was sheer morality. What really saved me was the people. 
Charmian nurses Jack back to health and helps him end this period of nihilistic pessimism. Jack takes up residence at Wake Robin Lodge and begins to lead a healthier life. Except that he is becoming somewhat lame and never walks when he can ride. Once again, Jack finds himself with more expenses than income. Nonetheless, he gets an advance from his publisher and buys the 130-acre hill ranch in the Sonoma Valley, where he hopes someday to build a community based on his own socialist principles, as well as modern farming techniques that will be ecologically sustainable. I am the sailor on horseback, watch my dust. Oh, I shall make mistakes of many, but watch my dreams come true. Try to dream with me my dreams of fruitful acres. Do not be a slave to an old conception. Only try to realize what I am after. Jack's book, War of the Classes, is published and reprinted in June, October, and November. Broke from his purchases of land and equipment, he goes on a lecture tour to raise money and promote his books. Invited to lecture to a businessman's club in Stockton, California, he creates an uproar. When at the end of the lecture, he calls the socialists in Russia, when the uprising of 1905 killed some of the Tsar's officials, his brothers. The press roars. Jack London calls Russian assassins his brothers. The press has another field day with Jack's comments. When at a lecture, he quotes William Lloyd Garrison on slavery as saying, the hell with the Constitution. Papers from New York to California are ripe with headlines saying Jack London says, to hell with the Constitution. Some libraries and organizations ban his books, but the controversy provides free advertising and his sales soar. Jack sticks to his guns, and during his tour reads repeatedly from his essay, Revolution. If modern man's food and shelter getting efficiency is a thousandfold greater than that of the caveman, why then are there 10 million people in the United States today who are not properly sheltered and properly fed? Why then today are there 1,752,187 child laborers? The capitalist class has not only not made the best of its management, but made the worst of it. The revolution is here now. Stop it. Who can? He finishes the boxing story, The Game and a new dog story, White Fang. The game grabs headlines when it is criticized for being overly gory and unrealistic. But Jimmy Brett, the lightweight champion of the world, comes to Jack's defense when he declares this story authentic. People find fault with me for my disgusting realism. Life is full of disgusting realism. I know men and women as they are, millions of them, yet in the slime stage, but I am an evolutionist, therefore a broad optimist. Hence my love for the human, and the slime though he be, comes from my knowing him as he is, and seeing the divine possibilities ahead of him. That's the whole motive of my white fang. I feel that I can never lay enough stress upon the marvelous power and influence of environment. Jack London has become the leading young writer in America and a spearhead of the controversy on evolution, socialism, and literature. If you wish to compliment me, call me the Jack London of the British Isles. George Bernard Shaw, Dallas Times-Herald, 1905. I wanted to be a two-fisted Jack London He-Man sailor to knock him cold and eat him alive. Eugene O'Neill, playwright. Mark Twain said, It would serve this man London right to have the working class get control of things. He'd have to call out the militia to collect his royalties. But at the same time that he was a socialist, he was a rugged individualist. He worked hard and he believed that he should have the results of his labor, that his money was his to do as he wanted with. His early talks and uh, lectures, his early writings, plus the book that he wrote, The Iron Heel, have always made him very, very popular in Russia. The bad part of uh, Russian admiration of Daddy is that they never paid him a penny. No royalties ever came from Russia. 1905. Jack forms the Intercollegiate Socialist Society, along with such notables as Upton Sinclair, 
Clarence Darrow, Norman Thomas, Eugene Debs, Mother Jones, and members of 43 workers' organizations. In the middle of the tour, Jack's divorce is finalized, and on November 19, 1905, he marries Charmian Kittredge. This creates yet another sensation. When local newspapers declare the marriage invalid in Illinois, where state law requires people to wait a year to remarry after a divorce. Jack replies, Great Scott, is that so? Well, we will get married tomorrow in Wisconsin and every other state in the Union if necessary. Although this proves unnecessary, it creates more publicity when a number of libraries and organizations decry Jack's morals and call for a ban on his books. Some of his lectures are canceled. In January 1906, after a honeymoon in Jamaica and Cuba, Charmian and Jack returned to New York City for the first open meeting of the Intercollegiate Socialist Society, of which Jack has been named president. Between four and 10,000 socialists gather for the meeting at the Grand Palace Hotel, and according to Upton Sinclair, give Jack a five-minute cheering ovation before he is allowed to speak. When Upton Sinclair cannot get a publisher for his book, The Jungle, Jack helps raise the money for it, writes the introduction, and helps popularize it. This expose of the exploitative labor practices and grossly unsanitary conditions in the meatpacking industry in Chicago helps foster public pressure and leads to the passage of the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. Upton Sinclair, unhappy with the legislation, writes, I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident, I hit it in the stomach. Jack and Charmian move to Wake Robin Lodge in Glen Allen, California, and begin to carry out a plan to build their own boat and sail around the world. But their plans are interrupted by the San Francisco earthquake. Early in the morning of April 18th, 1906, the great earthquake hit, struck the, the Bay Area, Jack and Charmian were shaken awake on the ranch, which is about an hour's drive north of San Francisco. They immediately got on horseback and rode all over the ranch, checking out the damage. There was damage, but it was not extensive. And fairly quickly, um, they got off the horses, hopped on a train, and rode the train north to Santa Rosa, which is only a short ride. It's incredible to me that the rails were still usable, but they were, and Jack and, and Charmian walked the streets of Santa Rosa and took pictures. Then they hopped a different train and went back down to San Francisco and spent 24 hours roaming the streets and even uh, going on a small boat out into the bay to look back on the city and to, to document and photograph the damage that they saw. And then, of course, the disastrous, devastating fires that developed. London filed the first piece of on-the-spot journalism about the earthquake, and it was published a week later or so in Collier's Magazine. The story of an eyewitness by Jack London, Collier's special correspondent. First published in Collier's, May 5th, 1906. On Wednesday morning at a quarter past five came the earthquake. A minute later, the flames were leaping upward in a dozen different quarters south of Market Street. In the working class ghetto and in the factories, fire started. There was no opposing the flames. There was no organization, no communication. All the cunning adjustments of a 20th century city had been smashed by the earthquake. The streets were humped into ridges and depressions and piled with the debris of fallen walls. The steel rails were twisted into perpendicular and horizontal angles. The telephone and telegraph systems were disrupted and the great water mains had burst. All the shrewd contrivances and safeguards of man have been thrown out of gear by 30 seconds twitching of the Earth's crust. Wednesday night saw the destruction of the very heart of the city. Dynamite was lavishly used, and many of San Francisco's proudest structures were crumbled by man himself into ruins. But there was no withstanding the onrush of the flames. Time and again, successful stands were made by the firefighters, and every time the flames flanked around on either side or came up from the rear, and turned to defeat the hard-won victory. Before the flames, throughout the night, fled tens of thousands of homeless ones. Some were wrapped in blankets. Others carried bundles of bedding and dear household treasures. 
Sometimes a whole family was harnessed to a carriage or delivery wagon that was weighted down with their possessions. Baby buggies, toy wagons, and go-karts were used as trucks, while every other person was dragging a trunk. Yet everybody was gracious. The most perfect courtesy obtained. Never in all San Francisco's history were her people so kind and courteous as on this night of terror. All night, these tens of thousands fled before the flames. Many of them, the poor people from the labor ghetto, they held on longest to their trunks. And over these trunks, many a strong man broke his heart that night. The hills of San Francisco are steep, and up these hills, mile after mile, were the trunks dragged. Everywhere were trunks, with across them lying their exhausted owners, men and women. Often after surmounting a heartbreaking hill, they would find another wall of flame advancing upon them at right angles and be compelled to change anew the line of their retreat. In the end, completely played out after toiling for a dozen hours like giants, thousands of them were compelled to abandon their trunks. Surrender was complete. There was no water. The sewers had long since been pumped dry. There was no dynamite. Another fire had broken out further uptown, and now from three sides, conflagrations were sweeping down. The fourth side had been burned earlier in the day. In that direction stood the tottering walls of the Examiner Building, the burned-out call building, the smoldering ruins of the Grand Hotel, and the gutted, devastated, dynamited Palace Hotel. On Thursday morning at a quarter past five, just 24 hours after the earthquake, I sat on the steps of a small residence on Knob Hill. With me sat Japanese, Italians, Chinese, and Negroes, a bit of the cosmopolitan flotsam of the wreck of the city. All about were the palaces of the Nabob pioneers of 49. To the east and south at right angles were advancing two mighty walls of flame. And so dawned the second day on stricken San Francisco. An hour later, I was creeping past the shattered dome of the city hall. Most of the stone had been shaken from the great dome, leaving standing the naked framework of steel. Market Street was piled high with the wreckage, and across the wreckage lay the overthrown pillars of the city hall, shattered into short crosswise sections. The section of the city, with the exception of the mint and the post office, was already a waste of smoking ruins. Here and there through the smoke, creeping warily under the shadows of tottering walls, emerged occasional men and women. It was like the meeting of the handful of survivors after the day of the end of the world. San Francisco at the present time is like the crater of a volcano around which are camped tens of thousands of refugees. At the Presidio alone are at least 20,000. All the surrounding cities and towns are jammed, the homeless ones, where they are being cared for by the relief committees. The refugees were carried free by the railroads to any point they wish to go, and it is estimated that over 100,000 people have left the peninsula on which San Francisco stood. The government has the situation in hand. And thanks to the immediate relief given by the whole United States, there is not the slightest possibility of a famine. The bankers and businessmen have already set about making preparations to rebuild San Francisco. In 1905-1906, Jack London was buying the ranch property uh, and he had declared to many people that he was gonna spend the next 10 years on the ranch um, really going at being a rancher and a farmer. Uh, well, that didn't last too long. He retained his commitment to this, but right away he announced to Charmian that he wanted to build a boat and launch on an around-the-world voyage of multiple years' length. And so he did have uh, the boat built. It was a 40-foot catch that they named the Snark. Despite the increased cost of labor and materials due to the earthquake, Jack continues with his plan to build his own boat and sail around the world for seven years. 
The 45-foot boat is to be built of the finest materials and manned by a crew of six, including Jack and Charmian. To finance the boat, Jack sells the rights to his adventures to various magazines. The boat christened the Snark turns into a comedy of errors. The delays are endless. On April 23, 1907, the Snark finally set sail for Hawaii. Originally budgeted $7,000, the boat ends up costing more than $30,000. And once they get to sea, it leaks like a sieve. The food rots, the engine doesn't work, the gasoline leaks out of the tanks, and even the lifeboat leaks. Things deteriorate further. When Jack realizes that Roscoe Eames, whom Jack hired as captain and trusted to guide them across the ocean, doesn't know how to navigate. Jack manages to teach himself navigation from some of the many books he has brought along with him. 27 days later, after having weathered many a gale and short rations, they arrive in Honolulu to be greeted by cables informing them that the snark and all hands had been lost at sea. Not surprisingly, when they uh, reached landfall in Honolulu, Uncle Roscoe was dispatched home to California, summarily, on a steamer. Uh, London continued as the navigator for the rest of their trip. Jack's accounts of surfing and the beauties of Hawaii help popularize the sport and bring in tourism. One of the most important episodes in their voyage on the snark was calling in on the island of Molokai. The Londons spent a full week living in the colony, the leper colony on Molokai, experiencing life among the colony um, residents. And the Londons uh, were fairly fearless, really, in living among the lepers. They, they weren't overly worried about catching the disease, but they were able to portray the leper colony both in, in text and in images, in photographs, uh, realistically, without the sensationalism, uh, the hyperbole that had been employed by other people writing about the leper colony. And some of the photographs that London captured on, in the colony are remarkable documents of what is really a thriving, lively colony of people who have built up a life making the best of a very sad situation, but finding joy and fulfillment uh, among their fellow residents. Jack's article on the leper colony on Molokai contributes greatly to the world's understanding of the disease. He is, however, criticized in the Honolulu papers for bringing the subject to light. He further angers the Hawaiian elite with his Hawaiian and South Sea tales in which Jack is highly critical of colonialism, the exploitation of workers, and the Hawaiian social hierarchy. When I come here to the States, uh, I can see that uh, people know very well the dog stories of Jack London. But in Europe, we both like, um, uh, of course, dog stories like White Fang or The Call of the Wild and the story of the Far North. But we also appreciate the, appreciate the, the political stories, the High Run Hill and the essays, the essays, Revolution, for example. He espoused radical socialist politics, was labeled a communist agitator, and had an FBI file. He wrote for and was read by the working class, and he believed he spoke for the struggles of the common people with sensitivity to all forms of oppression. Though he sometimes espoused racist ideas, the heroes in his short stories are nearly all non-white. More than any other writer of his day, or perhaps ours as well, London portrayed believable characters from many cultures, Earl Labor. In 1937, Leon Trotsky, describing Jack London's book, The Iron Heel, writes, Not one of the revolutionary Marxists, including Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg, imagined so fully the ominous alliance between financial capital and labor aristocracy. In 1907, Jack London already foresaw and described the fascist regime as the inevitable result of the defeat of the proletarian revolution. On his deathbed, Lenin had Jack London's story, Love of Life, read to him. On October 7, 1907, the snark set sail for the Marquesas without adequate directions.
the passage of the snark to the Marquesa Islands is, is quite a story in itself. There, there are two or three routes that one can follow uh, over, the, uh, over the sea to reach the Marquesans. And the Londons unwittingly chose the one that's the most dangerous. It looked the shortest to them, but it's the one that's filled with the greatest danger. And indeed, they, they ran into trouble. They were, uh, they were adrift for a while. The wind died away, uh, they, so they were making no progress. They began to run very short of water, and they were getting no rainfall. And so they began to realize why almost no one would take that particular crossing, would take that particular route. But luckily, the wind came up, the, the rain fell, they were able to replenish their water supply, and they made it. So when you look at the, the voyage of the snark overall, it's pretty nearly a miracle that they survived at all. They should never have survived. They should have perished because they were, they were like the, the, uh, almost the ignorant, um, the innocents who were, were out traveling and didn't know what awaited them. But they surmounted one danger after another uh, to the amazement of some of the people who, who witnessed what they were doing. Battling lakes, storms, squalls, and the doldrums. Some two months later, in the midst of a heavy squall, the snark makes land at Nukahiva, where both Herman Melville and Robert Louis Stevenson had lived, and Paul Gauguin had died. Dreaming of seeing the Gardens of Paradise, depicted in Melville's Taipei, which Jack had longed to see since his youth, the crew set out on horseback to visit the valley. The word Taipei originally signified an eater of human flesh. The men were described by Captain Cook as in almost every instance of lofty stature, scarcely ever less than six feet in height. And now all the strength and beauty has departed, and the valley of Taipei is the abode of some dozen wretched creatures, afflicted by leprosy, elephantitis, and tuberculosis. Life has rotted away in this wonderful garden spot, where the climate is as delightful and healthful as to be found in the world. Those who had been accustomed to eating their enemies had been eaten by the microorganisms introduced by the inevitable white man. The Snark's next port of call is Tahiti, where Jack and Charmian are anxious to receive their mail from San Francisco. Upon arrival, they are once again met with reports of their demise at sea. The Londons were reported lost at sea, dead, perished, you name it. And uh, again, Remember that Jack London is enormously popular internationally, not just in the U.S. Anything he was doing made the newspapers. Anything he, he was rumored to be doing or rumored to have done would make the newspapers. People read about this voyage with enormous interest. They followed the progress. And if the Londons were overdue at any port of call, then the newspapers, the media went, went into a frenzy of, oh, they must be lost. They've been lost at sea. So people followed this with great excitement and great interest. When they reach Tahiti, Jack finds that his finances are in a shambles. The mortgage on Flora's home has been foreclosed. Several checks have been overdrawn and refused for insufficient funds, and he has only $66 to his name. Jack manages to scrape up the funds to return to San Francisco on the SS Mariposa. During the week in San Francisco, Jack visits with his daughters and the crowd. Much to Charmian's despair, he again begins drinking and smoking heavily. Despite the financial panic which has taken hold on the country during his journey, Jack is able to obtain enough in advances against his nearly complete novel Martin Eden and articles on the snark to resume his voyage. On Tahiti and Samoa, they actually captured photographs of uh, the islanders enjoying and learning about their, their gramophone. The Londons had taken a gramophone and a large supply of sound recordings with them. And the, the islanders found this absolutely fascinating, a machine that could issue forth music and other noises. Um, and it just, it, it was a, really a, a, an interesting time of discovery on both sides. Eventually they traveled onto the Solomon Islands, um, having been warned about the cannibalism, the, uh, the dangerous islanders that they would have to face. And indeed, they began to wear sidearms. There are photographs of Charmian wearing, wearing a pistol on her hip. Jack writes to George Sterling. For the last three or four months, the snark has been cruising about the Solomons. This is about the rawest edge of the world. Headhunting, cannibalism, and murder are rampant. We are never unarmed, and night watches are necessary. 
the Londons are invited to join the Minolta, a ship recruiting Bushmen for slave labor on the plantations. She had been captured six months before on the Malaita coast, and her captain chopped to pieces with tomahawks. Charmian and I went on a cruise on another boat around the island of Malaita. The natives we encountered, men and women, go stark naked and are armed with bows, arrows, spears, tomahawks, war clubs, and rifles. And to cap it all, we got wrecked on a reef. The minute before we struck, not a canoe was in sight. But they began to arrive like vultures out of the blue. Half of our sailors held them off with rifles, while the other half worked to save the vessel. And down on the beach, a thousand bushmen gathered for the loot. But they didn't get it, nor us. Charmian London was um, a very excellent sailor. And in fact, Jack would say later that she was a better sailor than he was. And she was a darn fine navigator. And she would uh, uh, staff the helm. And she was good at all of these. Uh, and, and she was a real trooper. She was a good mate for London because she entered into every adventure that, that he dreamed up. Uh, she always entered into these things with enthusiasm, with joy, and with energy. Uh, and she really thrived on this, on, on the voyage of the snark. There's a wonderful photograph of her with some nearly naked um, islanders. And uh, one of the magazines started out refusing to publish that photograph. This made London furious because he said, if I am fine with your publishing that photograph, then you should just publish it. And the interesting thing is that they weren't objecting to Charmian being in the picture with nude men they were objecting to the fact that she didn't look shocked or stunned, and she was not averting her eyes from the, the nudity around her. And this was what bothered the magazine editors. But ultimately, London had his way, and they published that photograph. But, but Charmian was, was, um, was every bit the adventurer that, that Jack was. Once the Londons reached the Solomon Islands, uh, they and Martin Johnson and the others were, were all ill with one or more ailments. Um, they seemed to pick up everything you could pick up in the South Pacific. Uh, all of them had yaws, which is a, a spirochete that, that burrows under the skin and can travel through the bloodstream if left untreated for long enough. Uh, they also had various fevers. So they actually abandoned the, the snark in the Solomons. The Londons uh, took a steamer to Australia where they spent some time in a hospital recovering from their ailments. Uh, London chose to treat his yaws with mercury, uh, poured directly onto the, the wound. Uh, the, the, the rest of the crew, Charmian, Martin Johnson, and the others, weren't so wild on doing that, and that was probably wise, because London almost certainly uh, gave himself mercury poisoning, and that is probably what took his life later on. Uh, he, it, it's unknown exactly what he died from, but uh, a physician named Philip Clemmer has analyzed London's writings and his life and is pretty sure that it was mercury poisoning that, that took his life eventually. Jack travels from the Solomons to Sydney, Australia, where he has successfully operated on for a double fistula. Charmian is also ill from malarial fever, but with his hands and feet swollen, his nails thickening, and his skin peeling from a disease the doctors are unable to diagnose, Jack is unable to write. After several weeks' rest, Jack covers the Jack Johnson-Tommy Burns heavyweight championship fight for the Australian Star and the New York Herald. Although women are not admitted to the bout, Charmy and at Jack's insistence get special permission to attend the fight. Charmy and is heartbroken when Jack realizes his sickness is of such a serious nature that he must abandon the voyage of the snark. They decide on a sea voyage to regain their health and continue their adventures. They book passage on the Turmeric, a cargo steamer headed for South America. Martin Johnson was left to do something with the snark. He sold it, and to the, the London's unhappiness, uh, the, the snark later became a slave ship in the South Pacific. The London's had spent about $30,000 to build the snark, and Martin Johnson sold it for $3,000. After more than two years adventuring abroad, Jack London returns home to find his finances and literary career in complete disarray. The magazines have not been buying his stories, 
and he has taken on a great amount of debt by buying additional ranch land while on his trip. Jack's health improves, and he soon discovers that his illness was related to exposure to the ultraviolet rays of the tropics. He recalls all of his stories from the magazines and promises them new and better material. The publication of Martin Eden, now considered a great American classic, is met with a lukewarm reception. But Jack's follow-up novel, Burning Daylight, proves to be popular, and his stories once again begin selling to the magazines. London had a, a large influence on uh, a variety of writers. Uh, he, of course, was an influence on Hemingway. Uh, he was an influence on Steinbeck, Eugene O'Neill. Uh, he was also an influence on popular writers, uh, such as Robert E. Howard, the creator of Conan the Barbarian, uh, and just a slew of science fiction writers, um, just on down, I think, to writers such as Michael Crichton. Of course, when he was alive, he was a kind of international celebrity. He was very widely read, extremely popular. Um, and, you know, after his death, culturally, some things changed. One of the things that uh, did kind of influence a, de a decline and uh, had an influence on the decline in London's popularity uh, was that, you know, he was a socialist, he was a political radical, uh, and in the climate when English departments uh, began to uh, develop into what they are today in the 50s, uh, that was a kind of uh, an unpopular political position. Uh, he was also um, a working class writer, which was, was not the norm, uh, so that I think had a kind of negative impact. Um, he also was, you know, his, his primary strength as a writer, aesthetically, is the short story. Jack London on writing and writers. Don't loaf and invite inspiration. Light out after it with a club. And if you don't get it, you will nonetheless get something that looks remarkably like it. Set yourself a stint and see that you do that stint every day. Study the tricks of the writers who have arrived. They have mastered the tools with which you are cutting your fingers. Keep a notebook. Travel with it. Eat with it. Sleep with it. Slap into it every stray thought that flutters up into your brain. And work. Spell it in capital letters. Work. Work all the time. Find out about this earth, this universe, this force and matter, and the spirit that glimmers up through force and matter from the maggot to Godhead. And by all of this, I mean work for a philosophy of life. It does not hurt how wrong your philosophy of life may be, so long as you have one and have it well. The three great things are good health, work, and a philosophy of life. I may add, nay, must add a fourth, sincerity. Without this, the other three are without avail. With it, you may cleave to greatness and sit among the giants. With his new success, Jack expands his ranch and takes on more debt, buying the 700-acre Kohler and Froling Ranch and Vineyards. Jack's legendary hospitality resumes, and the ranch is filled with guests. Hijinks and practical jokes abound, and it is up to Charmian to keep order and see to it that Jack keeps to his daily work regimen. By Christmas of 1909, Charmian realizes she is pregnant. Jack, delighted by the prospect, decides it is time for a permanent home, and he begins to build the Wolf House, a 15,000-square-foot structure he claims will last a 1,000 years. On June 13th, Charmian enters the hospital, and on June 19th, gives birth to a baby girl named Joy. But 38 hours after the birth, the child dies. Charmian is put under sedation. Jack is distraught. Later that day, he gets into a fight in a bar in which he claims he was attacked. Jack and his black eye make headlines across the country. But with Charmian out of danger, he fulfills his prior commitment to the New York Herald to cover the upcoming Jeffries Johnson heavyweight championship fight to be held on July 4th, 1910 in Reno, Nevada.
Um, two of the most interesting episodes in his life when it comes to looking at London and race are the two world heavyweight boxing matches. London covered the uh, Burns-Johnson uh, match. And at first, he was, oh, the white man will win. You know, I'm going to root for my own kind, wouldn't you? But as you read his dispatches from Sydney, he becomes pretty quickly converted to Johnson. And then in 1910, in Reno, Johnson was matched with the great white hope who came out of retirement to the clamor of millions. Jack London admired Jack Johnson greatly, it turns out. However, when he sent in his newspaper copy to syndicates that published it all over the world, in almost every country, this was big news. The editors, sometimes for space and sometimes for other reasons, not wanting to allow London to praise an African American, they edited his work. Once again, as Johnson sent down to defeat the chosen representative of the white race, and this time, the greatest of them all. And as of old, it was play for Johnson. There is nothing heavy or primitive about this man Johnson. He has a perfect mechanism of mind and body. His mind works like a chain lightning and his body obeys with equal swiftness. After six weeks of recuperation, Charmian returns home. Jack buys a 30-foot yacht, the Roamer, and he and Charmian spend months aboard the ship. At sea, Jack's depression passes, and Charmian, although still suffering from her loss, puts on her best face to cheer Jack on. Jack continues to churn out a thousand words a day, selling nearly everything he writes for top dollar. The Smoke Baloo stories, which he considers to be hack work, end up being extremely popular. Still, he finds himself in debt, as he must sustain his several households and the army of workmen building up the ranch and wolf house. In addition, he decides to plant 20,000 eucalyptus trees. No matter how much money he makes, he is always in debt. In 1911 and 12, the Londons traveled to the East Coast and toured up and down the coast. Jack London was drinking very, very heavily, and Charmian was quite concerned about this for its effect on his health as well as on his writing. And she was trying to get him to stop. And they decided that they would um, book passage on, on a ship to go around Cape Horn. Charmian was happy about this because it would get London away from the sources of, of alcohol. He would be away from the bars, etc. Uh, and, and London was just eager for another adventure. So they, they boarded the, the Dirigo um, in Baltimore and sailed south through the Atlantic and then went, went through Cape Horn and then up the west coast to Seattle. Um, it was about a five month voyage. And London, uh, characteristically, took photographs. Aboard the Dirigo, Jack finishes his novel, Valley of the Moon and makes copious notes for the mutiny of the Elsinore and John Barleycorn. Charmian writes a short story entitled The Wheel, which he sells for $125. After three months at sea, battling raging storms and high seas, the Dirigo makes the passage around Cape Horn. For exercise, Charmian and Jack box, train and play with their new puppy. Together, they climb to the top of the mainmast where Jack reads and Charmian embroiders. Charmian becomes pregnant again, expecting a child in March. They return to Oakland on August 2nd, filled with great expectations. On August 8th, Jack leaves for the hijinks at the Bohemian Club. Charmian enters the hospital four days later and loses the child. Their hopes for a son are forever lost. 1913 turns out to be a year of disasters for Jack. The ranch loses its fruit crop, its corn crop and eucalyptus trees to frost locusts and hot winds. Jack suffers from an appendicitis. His nephew Irving Shepard is nearly electrocuted. And on August 22, 1913, the Wolf House on which Jack has spent $70,000 burns to the ground. The fire was started in a pile of oily rags that sat right in front of that fireplace that we see through this window opening. 
the workers that day had uh, finished very carefully uh, putting linseed oil and turpentine on all the plank floors. The temperature that day was over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and sometime after the workers left, by spontaneous combustion, the center of this pile of oily rags exploded, burned, spread to the floor that was loaded with uh, fuel, all that oil, and spread throughout the entire U-shape of the house. A forensics fire study team came through here uh, in uh, the 1990s, uh, did a very uh, thorough study, and came to the conclusion also that uh, the fire was uh, spontaneous combustion. Uh, so uh, all those theories in the past of uh, Jack London's enemies, uh, because he was a socialist, or Charmian London burning the house down herself, apparently uh, was false. It was quite tragic, and it was uh, one of the few times that uh, was documented that Jack London actually broke down uh, after he had gone back to the cottage where he and Charmian lived. Uh, that was supposed to be temporary quarters because they were looking forward to moving in here. And uh, uh, Charmian went in to say goodnight to Jack and uh, noticed that Jack had uh, broken down and uh, had his uh, head on his, uh, on his hands and was crying. And so she just uh, felt the best thing to do was just leave him alone and, and let him suffer through that night. Uh, what's interesting about the relationship between Jack and Charmian is that four days after that, in her diary, she wrote down, they were so happy together, uh, we have never been happier. And that was only four days after the fire. So that gives you an idea of the tremendous bond and love that uh, the two had for each other. In April 1914, Colliers offers Jack $1,100 a week and expenses to cover the Mexican Revolution and the potential American occupation of Veracruz. Even though London's health was beginning to suffer um, by about 1913-14, he still was interested in witnessing adventure, experiencing it, and doing journalism. Uh, again, it's a way to make money, but it also is a way for him to get in the thick of things, which he, and that's where he always liked to be. So he set off to Mexico, to Veracruz, to cover the Mexican Revolution. And interestingly, this time Charmian went with him. Uh, and he, he captured some, some amazing photographs of um, the, the constitutionalists, um, the, the, the women fighters called the soldaderas. Uh, he was fascinated by that, and he said, you wouldn't want to meet these women in a dark alley. You know, they were pretty fierce, um, but, but he, was, he was intrigued by the human stories. He visited the prisoners in San Juan de Ulua prison, and he interacted with them, talked with them, heard their stories, photographed them. But he cut, had to cut this, this trip short because his health was not good. And so they, they returned to the ranch. So he was only there covering the revolution for a short time. Jack's dispatches from Mexico support United States intervention as being beneficial to the Mexican people. Jack is roundly criticized by the socialist press for changing his position on the revolution and supporting racism, imperialism, and American oil interests. Once again, due to his ill health, Jack returns to the ranch. Jack's novels are being made into films and his royalties from his many books and stories are for once exceeding his expenditures, but his kidneys are failing. Jack sold the rights to the Sea Wolf to Hobart Bosworth, who made the silent film, only to find that two other versions of the story were playing at the same time. The pirates claim that when Jack had sold the magazine serialization, he lost his film rights. In 1912, to protect their copyrights, Jack and other leading authors had founded the Authors League. They now banded together and lobbied Congress and got it to change the copyright law in favor of the authors. To distinguish between pirated film productions and authorized film productions, Jack recorded a short clip featuring himself at the beginning of those films he sanctioned. This shot of Jack appeared before the film Martin Eden in 1914. 
Jack is intent on making his Beauty Ranch a model for farms everywhere. He buys and breeds the best livestock money can buy. This piggery was uh, finished in 1915, uh, just a little over a year before Jack died. So he was just uh, in the process of uh, accomplishing some of his dreams for this ranch. He wanted this ranch to be the showplace of agriculture in all of California. Uh, he worked very hard at the end to try to achieve that. Uh, he spared no expense. He already knew that he was going to die because uh, his doctor, Dr. Porter, uh, had told him after doing a test on him uh, that his kidneys were in terrible condition uh, and that he didn't have long to live. So what Jack London did was to pour as much money into this ranch as possible to develop it before he died. In owning such a big ranch and spending so much money, uh, he was counter to what socialism was about. What he was actually trying to do was to create uh, what you might call a utopian society, a place that, uh, that was uh, self-sufficient, uh, a place where uh, people could live and work, and uh, a place where they could enjoy life. 1915. Jack writes two new dog novels, Jerry of the Islands and Michael, Brother of Jerry. These books help foster protective legislation for animals in the United States and Europe and lead to the formation of animal welfare clubs. Due to Jack's poor health in December of 1915, he and Charmian return to Hawaii, where he hopes to recuperate from uremia. Jack disagrees with the radical press about the outbreak of the First World War, refusing to accept it as a capitalist war, and calls for America's intervention on the side of the Allies. In Honolulu on March 7, 1916, Jack resigns from the Socialist Party. Dear comrades, I am resigning from the Socialist Party because of its lack of fire and fight and its loss of emphasis upon the class struggle. Since the whole trend of socialism in the United States during recent years has been one of peaceableness and compromise, I find that my mind refuses further sanction of my remaining a party member. Hence, my resignation. In Hawaii, Jack addresses the Pan-Pacific Union and advocates the principle of the brotherhood of mankind and the recognition of that principle as the guiding star of the peoples of the Pacific. Back in California, Jack's health continues to deteriorate. And on November 22nd, Jack dies. Irving Stone, in his biography, Sailor on Horseback, stirs up controversy when he intimates that the cause of death was suicide by an overdose of morphine. I don't see that he was in despair and ready to take his life. For one thing, um, he had just been reading Carl Jung. He was eager to incorporate some of those ideas into his writings. He did it, for example, in the, the short story, The Water Baby. He had more he wanted to do with this. He had more he wanted to say. For another thing, he had just arranged to have a picnic with his two daughters who didn't come to the ranch very often. Um, he was going to meet them in a few days' time. He wrote a note about that just a day or two before he died. I don't believe for a minute he would have made that plan, then taken his own life. I don't think he would have done that to his daughters. He loved his daughters very much. He kept wanting to improve his relationship with them. I think that he had a lot more he wanted to do. So I do not believe that he committed suicide. This room actually is where uh, Jack was found in a coma by his uh, last manservant named Sakini. And uh, uh, he was not able to wake Jack. Uh, after Jack London was found in a coma, he was treated by doctors um, who had a couple of the, uh, of the workers on the ranch uh, take Jack London, uh, one under each arm, and try to walk him around the hallway here in the cottage uh, to see if uh, that might possibly wake him up. And it was during this process that it was noticed that one side of Jack's body uh, was totally limp. 
which indicates that he had already suffered the stroke that would eventually lead to death. He lived only till 7.45 p.m. that night. The cause of death was kidney failure, and this was uh, what was uh, put on the death certificate. His body was taken from the bed there and was taken to his work studio where it was uh, laid out so that people could say their goodbyes. And then the next day the body was taken to um, Oakland where it was cremated. And then the ashes were brought back here to the ranch where a uh, private uh, silent ceremony was held on the knoll where you can now see his grave site. Uh, no one said a word. It was a very dark and cold November day, uh, a little bit drizzly. Uh, Charmian said at the end of the ceremony, uh, all of a sudden, out of the darkened sky, rays of light came through and shone directly on the gravesite. The spot there that uh, we're looking at with uh, Charmian's bed uh, is where Charmian London died in 1955. She never remarried after Jack had died in 1916 uh, and uh, uh, wrote and talked very fondly of the relationship that she had had with Jack London uh, through those years that they were together. Uh, which basically amounted to the last 13 years of Jack's life. I would rather be ashes than dust. I would rather that my spark should burn out in a brilliant blaze than it should be stifled by dry rot. I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy and permanent planet. The function of man is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. Jack London died at the age of 40. <laughs> Thank you.